This is a case where a man would spend 25 years in prison for a murder that even the district attorney who prosecuted him knew he did not do. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Michael Morton. Viewer discretion is advised. Michael Morton was a successful manager at a grocery store, Safeway, um, in Austin, Texas. On April 7th, 1979, he would marry his wife, Christine. Christine was born on April 18th, 1959, in Texas, and growing up, she was always described as a very feisty, vivacious lady. She was very big on personality, and family meant everything to her. Michael and Christine would go on to have a child, and his name is Eric. On April 12th, 1986, in Austin, Texas, Michael and Christine were out celebrating Michael's 32nd birthday. They had a lovely dinner. They had a sitter at home for Eric. When the dinner was over, Michael and Christine returned home. They excused the babysitter. Michael uh, wanted to finish the evening, you know, to celebrate his birthday by having some sex. Christine said, I'm too tired, not tonight, but tomorrow for sure, you know, we'll do it. Oh, this apparently upset Michael a little bit because, you know, it was his birthday, but, you know, he accepted and just moved on. Well, unfortunately, the next night wouldn't come for Christine. On April 13th, 1986, Michael woke up sometime before 5 a.m. He had to work that morning at 6, and he spent the morning getting ready, having a quick breakfast. He kissed Christine and Eric goodbye sometime around 5.30, 5.40 in the morning, and by 6 a.m., he had clocked into his work at the Safeway store. When Michael's shift was over, he clocked out and he went to the daycare center because he was supposed to be picking up Eric from there because Christine was supposed to have dropped him off. When Michael arrived at the daycare center, however, Eric was not there. The people who worked there said that Christine never dropped him off. Immediately feeling concerned, he called the house from the daycare. To his surprise, a sheriff's deputy answered the phone and they said, Michael, you need to come home immediately. You see, a couple of hours after Michael left for work, um, sometime in the late morning, Eric was found by a neighbor and he was just wandering around outside the house. And he was about three years old at the time. He had no shoes on. The neighbor walked up to him and said, are you okay? Is everything okay? And he had mentioned something about mommy being hurt. So the neighbor kind of apprehensively walked into the house and began looking around, calling out Christine's name. No one answered. The neighbor then walked into the master bedroom and she uncovered something unusual and horrific. On the bed was appeared to be just the comforter and on top of that was like a little suitcase and then this big brown wicker basket but the neighbor also noticed there was blood sprayed all over the walls and she also noticed that there was what appeared to be a hand sticking out from the comforter so the neighbor panicked and ran out of the house grabbed eric went to their house and called 911 and they got there within minutes. Police walked into the home and they noticed the same thing the neighbor did. So they took pictures of it and then they pulled the comforter off after they took down the wicker basket and the suitcase and they discovered an absolute bloody nightmare. Christine was on the bed lifeless. Her face was gone. She was completely unrecognizable because she had been beaten over the face many, many times. Eventually they would determine that she was hit at least eight times with some sort of wooden object because there was little literal pieces of wood 
stuck to her face. They would later come to the conclusion that the murder weapon was likely a 2x4 because there was a construction site like right behind uh, the house. The murder weapon, to my knowledge, was never actually recovered. Now again, there was just blood sprayed everywhere, all over the walls, all over the pictures near the nightstand. Blood just drenched all over the bed. During their cursory walkthrough, it appeared that nothing was stolen. There was no signs of forced entry. There was no, like, rummaging through things. Drawers weren't open. Jewelry was left out. Money wasn't taken from her wallet. They did find something that would later go on to be their holy grail of evidence. They found a note taped to the mirror in their bathroom. The note was written from Michael, and it was addressed to Christine. The note basically summarized that he was upset about not being able to have sex with his wife the night of his birthday. Um, but basically he said, like, you know, it'll, it, it'll be fine, we'll be fine, I can't wait to see you later. Police also never called Michael to report that his wife had been murdered. They never attempted to even notify him. He didn't even find out until he had to call his own home, checking on Christine, to find out that something horrible had happened. Police were immediately very suspicious of Michael. Even though when he got home, he was very clearly distraught. It did not appear to be an act. He willingly answered every single question police had asked him. They interviewed him many, many times over the course of the investigation. He completely and fully cooperated with everything the police asked him to do. Police interviewed his friends, his family, his co-workers, his neighbors. They all painted Michael as this totally normal, nice guy. The family seemed completely normal, uh, that they couldn't even imagine or picture Michael doing anything like this to Christine or anyone. On Christine's uh, body, they found a couple strands of hair tucked in her hand. They also found a small, what they called a clean stain of semen um, on the bedspread. And what they mean by clean is it only matched, it, it came back to just one person. So there wasn't like mixed DNA with hers and the assailants. That being said, police did not investigate anyone other than Michael Morton for the murder of his wife. They zeroed in on Michael and Michael alone. Even though he had an alibi, he clocked in at work at 6 a.m. He was seen by his coworkers. He was seen by customers. He was observed for many, many hours throughout the day. And there was no physical evidence stating that Michael was the one to physically murder his wife. There was none. They looked at that note that was taped to the mirror as the most incriminating evidence. He was so mad that Christine wouldn't have sex with him on his birthday that he lashed out out of anger and frustration and just took it out on her. Here's my issue, and I think of the issue with other people of this. Why on earth would he leave the most incriminating note possible, as clear as day, taped to the mirror, basically stating his motive. Why would he do that? Why would anyone do that? Police didn't care. They arrested him and they charged him with the murder of his wife. And by the way, there was no signs on Christine's body directly that she had been sexually assaulted. Yes, there was that semen stain on the bed, but there was no, they did like a, you know, a sexual assault kit and there was, she was not assaulted that way. The trial? It started in like record time. He went on trial starting February 9th, 1987. The district attorney was a man by the name of Ken Anderson. Why are the scummy ones always called Ken, right, Kratz? Anderson was described as like a super arrogant, full of himself kind of guy. He was overly confident in everything. But at the same time, he was also seen as a highly intelligent person. He was very strategic. He was cunning and he got the job done. 
The prosecution for this case was very, very well prepared, or so it would be implied. They brought in like this team to do this case as if it was like the, the crime and the trial of the century. Their main point of attack was to assassinate Michael Morton's character. The prosecution claimed that the marriage was not this happy marriage that everyone saw. They said the marriage was in a very bad way. Uh, both Michael and Christine were unhappy. Michael had this big temper. And ultimately, Michael killed her out of rage because he, would, he couldn't have sex. The hair they found in Christine's hand, the prosecution would state, was basically um, similar to Michael's hair. But this was also before DNA was really a, a major thing, so they really couldn't prove the hair was his. They also couldn't prove that the semen was his either. The other incriminating evidence they had was the fact that they were able to determine Christine's time of death by using her stomach contents. By doing so, they stated very emphatically that she had to have been murdered between 1.30 a.m. and 5.30 a.m., just before Michael would leave for work. In a very sick twist, Ken Anderson, during his closing arguments, would state that Michael killed Christine out of anger, then he took her hand after she was dead, placed it around his manhood, and pleasured himself with her hand, her dead hand. And the jury, they bought it. They bought all of it. They said that the stomach content and time of death evidence was the main incriminating factor for them. So Michael was convicted and he was sentenced to life without parole. And Ken Anderson said, what an injustice. He should have gotten death. And this story is far from being over. This was 34-year-old Deborah Jan Baker, and she also lived in Austin, Texas. Deborah was born on May 19, 1953, also in Texas. Deborah was described as a very ambitious woman. Um, she was also described as like being everyone's sister. She was just a very sisterly person. She loved everyone. She got along with everyone. Deborah worked in real estate. Uh, she had two children with her ex. Her ex-husband was Phil and they had uh, recently divorced and they had joint custody of their two kids. Uh, they would just go back and forth. It was, by all accounts, a very amicable divorce. The child custody situation was also very amicable. So Deborah lived alone, and on January 13th, 1988, and this is just 11 months after Michael Morton is convicted of the murder of his wife, Deborah does not have the kids at this time because they are with Phil. Well, on January 13th, 1988, Deborah does not show up for work. So her boss would call Deborah's mom because this is like super unusual for Deborah. She never, ever, ever does anything like this. She called the mom and said, hey, can you go check on Deborah? Because we're concerned. And they couldn't even reach her by phone. The last time anyone had seen Deborah was midnight the night before. And that was her sister because they were hanging out, just having drinks and just chatting. And when her sister left, everything seemed totally normal and fine. Deborah's mom went to the house. She pulled up and noticed that the car was still in the driveway, so Deborah had not left the house. She walked in. She kind of went from room to room, calling out Deborah's name, but again, no one answered. Nothing appeared out of the ordinary. Nothing appeared to be rummaged through, stolen, nothing like that. Not at first sight. And then she walks into the master bedroom and lying in the bed covered with a comforter and pillows basically draped all over her body like long ways was the body of Deborah. So police were obviously called and they arrived within moments. Deborah had been beaten in the face. She was unrecognizable. They determined that she was hit with some sort of heavy, like long object that was not found and she was struck at least six times. There was blood sprayed everywhere. 
They also noticed that Deborah had defensive wounds on her hands, so she tried to fight back. And then when her autopsy was done, it also appeared that she had not been sexually assaulted. And in this case, there was no, you know, semen or anything found on her or on the bed or anywhere. Deborah had recently had a window break in her home, so she covered it up with some like plastic tarp. So police initially thought, well, maybe the person broke in that way, but it wasn't disturbed enough to like say someone had like ripped it open and gone in. They actually determined after like dusting for fingerprints and all that, that the likely point of entry was a sliding glass door that was unlocked. When police did their search, they did notice a couple of things did appear to be missing after talking to some of her friends and family. There was her VCR. Look it up, young folk, if you don't know what that is. That was stolen from the top of her television. She also had all of the cash taken out of her purse, but her purse was left behind. There were open, like, jewelry boxes and jewelry kind of laid outs that wasn't stolen. They found a sort of soggy blue towel on the floor of the bathroom, and police would speculate that the killer may have taken a shower, meaning he may have been comfortable in this house. They also found hairs on Deborah's pink comforter, hairs that did not, or that were not similar to her own. Now, through all of their questioning and talking to friends, family, coworkers, neighbors, Deborah had no known enemies. Her ex-husband, Phil, lived just like a few minutes down the road. And again, they had a very amicable divorce. The, the child custody thing went smoothly without any issues. They first found out that the divorce was because there was some money issues and that they were just drifting apart. Police would kind of come up to their own conclusions that the, the divorce, nah, it was kind of ugly. And Phil, he wanted sole custody of those kids, even though there was no proof of that. Police basically just wanted this to be Phil. They wanted her killer to be Phil, signed, sealed, delivered, let's wrap it up, get him convicted, bada bing, bada boom. They were coming up with all sorts of theories just out of the air about why Phil would have done this. But again, they kept coming back to, well, this was because the divorce, the divorce was ugly and he wanted the kids. Well, surprise twist for the uh, coppers. What was the real reason they got divorced? Phil? He was gay. They divorced because of it, and Deborah wanted Phil to be happy. Phil wanted to, you know, live as who he actually was. And it turns out, he actually wanted less time with the kids. He, uh was really trying to negotiate just having them like on the weekends and not for like longer periods of time because he wanted to go out and live his life, I guess. But then the cops were like, well, his fingerprints are in the house. No shit, he uh, was there all the time. His kids live there, his ex-wife. They were never able to produce any evidence to even file charges against him, so they had to move on. By the way, this is a different county from the Christine Morton uh, murder investigation. So these are different police. They began to canvas the neighborhood. They started to really question all the people in Deborah's life, including like ex-boyfriends, jilted lovers, co-workers who may have had a grudge against her, but they couldn't find anyone. They then started to search known sex offenders and convicted criminals who were out and lived in the area, but they came up with nothing. And then the murder of Deborah Baker went cold. Now we are fast forwarding to 2002. At this point, Michael Morton has been in prison for 14 years for the murder of his wife, Christine. He had sent, you know, letters um, to various lawyers, but also to the Innocence Project, which if you don't know the Innocence Project, you should really look them up because they are a fantastic organization. They agreed to take on his case and they actually would end up finding a uh, post-conviction attorney for him. When the new lawyer takes over, he begins to kind of start from square one and starts to look at the evidence that police had to convict uh, Michael. But this new lawyer would be like, uh, there really wasn't any evidence. 
Michael was totally clean before all this. He had no criminal record. There were no witnesses to this crime. Well, actually there was, but we'll get back to that later. There was absolutely no history of violence in Michael's past. And it turns out he passed not one, but two polygraph examinations. He f passed it with flying colors. They would also, through digging through all of the uh, police files, would uncover the fact that the medical examiner did not even see Christine's body until two or three days after she was murdered. And the science behind stomach contents um, determining time of death, well, that relies on a fresh body. But when the examiner saw it, this she was far from fresh, which is ugh, that's a terrible thing to even say. Stomach content report could not, could not have been done correctly, which means the time of death that was stated, the one thing that apparently convinced the jury, well, that wasn't accurate. So they began looking deeper into the evidence logs and the evidence boxes. They came across something pretty, pretty insane. A piece of evidence that was collected was a blue bandana, and it was found roughly a hundred yards from the house that Christine was murdered in. Police didn't find this. It was a neighbor who found it. He didn't want to touch it in case it had something to do with the case because it had blood on it. It would actually be Michael Morton's brother, who the neighbor told, that would actually go out and safely collect the bandana to give to police. And police were like, oh, okay, thanks, great. Like, they didn't think anything of it. They just put it in a bag and they threw it in evidence and it never came up. Not until 2002 or 2004 or so when they actually uncovered the existence of this blue bandana. So, they wanted to test this bandana for not only the blood on there to make sure it's maybe Christine's, and possibly any other skin cell DNA that could maybe match another person and or, and or clear Michael. The new district attorney at this point, John Perry, he is a very politically motivated person. It's all about just, just convict, 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 and uh, innocence, whatever. <laughs> when Michael's attorneys wanted to get this blue bandana, he's like, no, no, we're not gonna, do no, sorry, you don't need it, nope. They appear to be desperate to get this blue bandana just squashed and not looked at. It took six years of back and forth legal battles of this John Perry guy being like, no, 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 sorry, 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 it's not relevant, you're not gonna have it. <laughs> it took them years to finally get a hearing and eventually the Court of Appeals, this is now, we're now in 2011, finally said, yes, you make sure they test that DNA on that bandana and you do it immediately. Because isn't the truth important? Because if it comes back and Michael's DNA is on it, great, we got the right guy in prison. If it's not his DNA on it, oops, well, let's go find the real person. They finally get this bandana tested. The blood 100% matches that of Christine Morton. There was other DNA on the bandana. It was male DNA that was conclusively not Michael Morton's DNA. So, District Attorney John Perry, he's like, uh, it's just, it's, it's not, no, no, it's fine. Uh, Michael probably just found the bandana somewhere in the neighborhood and just dipped it in uh, Christine's blood and then threw it where the people found it. Obviously, that's what happened. Why would DNA wasn't even a thing? Why would Michael even know to do that? <laughs> but he was out of it. No, Michael Morton killed her. Later on in 2011, the Innocence Project manages to get the entire um, police case with all the evidence, with all of the everything, um, basically uncovered and released publicly. Basically, they got all the criminal investigation information unsealed and Oh shit, as in, oh shit, the DA, well, we got a problem now. First, 
there was a footprint found in mud just outside the Morton house. It was not the same size as Michael's. But they never collected it. They never took a casting of it. They never took a photo of it. They didn't do shit with it. They dusted for fingerprints. They found foreign fingerprints on the sliding glass door of the Morton house. Foreign meaning they didn't match Michael's, they didn't match Christine's, but they didn't run the fingerprints to find out who they may belong to. They're like, eh, pfft, whatever. Next, there were witness sightings of a very strange kind of unkempt man literally driving around the neighborhood in the days prior in this like gross green rusty van. And he was seen walking and lurking around the neighborhood the day before the murder. Police were told about this. They said, no, it's not, it's not the same. No, it's not related to this. We're not gonna investigate it. And they didn't, they did not investigate it at all. And the biggest kicker of them all, the reason why I opened this video by saying that the DA knew Michael did not kill his wife. Eric, their three-year-old son, witnessed the entire thing. And he told his grandma, the grandma then went to police and they were managed to get a, a uh, basically a word for word, what, what Eric said happened. He said, a mean monster of a man came in and they hit my mommy over the head. And Eric kept calling him a monster. He was this big monster. And then he was asked, where was daddy when the monster was hitting mommy? He said, daddy was at work. They said, are you sure it wasn't daddy who was hitting mommy? He said, no. It was not daddy. Daddy had already gone to work. They kept that testimony from the defense. They never released it. They kept from the defense the sighting of the strange man. They kept from defense the fact that there were foreign fingerprints. They kept from the defense the fact that there was a large foot or shoe print found outside the house. They withheld all of this information for the purpose of convicting Michael Morton. Why? It's just the easiest thing, which we need to win, you know, elections and all that. So Michael's legal team begins to um, look into possibly other crimes and cold cases similar to this. Um, because Michael's still in prison at this point. After doing some digging, they uncover the cold case murder of Deborah Baker. The crime scene and how she was found was damn near identical to Christine Morton's. Covered with a comforter with objects placed on top. She was hit directly in the face multiple times. And in August of 2011, the DNA from Christine's case, the bandana it came back to one man, Mark Allen Norwood, a known and previously convicted felon who lived in the area of the Mortons. And in terms of Deborah Baker, he lived in her actual neighborhood just two streets over when during the time she was murdered. The hairs they collected from Deborah's pink comforter and DNA they found on the blue uh, towel, it all came back to match Mark Allen Norwood. If police had properly investigated the Christine Morton case, had they taken a few weeks to look into other suspects, they may have come across Mark Norwood, which means that if they had properly done their job and found the right guy back in 1986, Deborah Baker would be alive. I mean, she wouldn't have been murdered at that point in her life. In October of 2011, Michael Morton was finally released from prison after spending 25 years there for a murder he did not commit. For a murder that the district attorney knew he did not commit, but decided to convict him anyway. In November of 2011, Mark Allen Norwood, he is arrested for the murder of Christine Morton. He would go on trial for both women, Christine Morton and Deborah Baker. 
he was convicted of both murders and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The district attorney from the original case, Ken Anderson, who has now successfully finished his transformation into a human marshmallow, well, he always claimed that he did his job perfectly right. He did everything by the book and he didn't do anything wrong and at the time they convicted the right person. When confronted with, well, have you guys properly investigated this and convicted the right person, one woman would probably still be alive and her family, her two children, would still have her. He wouldn't take any ownership and he wouldn't say sorry, he wouldn't do anything. He would actually be arrested for, uh, for all of his basically tampering of evidence and withholding evidence from the Michael Morton case. Believe it or not, he would get convicted of all of this, but he basically just got a slap on the wrist and like had to pay like 500 bucks and he's no longer allowed to practice law. On May 16th, 2013, Texas Governor Rick Perry would sign a bill in, and it was called the Michael Morton Act. And it was made to ensure a more open discovery process so that Basically, the defense would have access at the time uh, that, like, when the DA has that same evidence. Michael had to attempt to reestablish relationships with his son and, you know, his, basically his in-laws because they were told that Michael did this. That's all they ever knew. I think they're still trying to rebuild those bridges. And in 2013, Michael would remarry and he is now living happily with her. So this is just another case of a shady police department and an extra shady district attorney who is just motivated by politics and just, you know, re-election. And it's kind of a scary thing because the same shit still happens. And if it could happen to someone like Michael Morton, I think it could literally happen to any single one of us. That is the end of today's story. So I hope you enjoyed. Well, like enjoyed is a hard, that's a bad word to use. I hope you found it interesting. As usual, if you have a case you would like me to cover, um, please go to my link tree, which I will put in the description below. Click on my case list that's in my link tree. Scroll through it. I have over 4,100 names on there. Um, if you don't see a name of someone you want me to cover, then send me an email. My email will also be in the description below. It's also in the case list document, but it's also truecrimer at gmail.com. And just send me a really brief email about who you want me to cover, and I'll add it to the list. Keep in mind, I choose the cases super randomly to make it fair. Um, so it could be three days from now, or it could be a year from now that I cover the case you recommend. So please be patient. And lastly, if you would like to support me in any way, my merch store is also in my link tree where we sell t-shirts and hoodies. We sell mugs and a wine glass and a beanie and other sorts of things. So check it out if you want. Um, yeah. So that is it for today. And until the next case, I will see you later. And ta-ta for now. True crime. A Rooney. No, God, that's just stop, Mike.